of this event. So I wanted to welcome you and I hope to see most of you come back during the remainder of the semester. I also wanted to introduce our new fellows at the center uh, because it's a new semester. We have uh, new faculty who are coming to the center to spend a semester with, with us. Mike Schneider is our postdoc, uh, formerly from the University of California, Irvine, and now from uh, Pete. He was with us last semester. Rayet von Bork uh, uh, from the University of Amsterdam will be our postdoc for the second half of this uh, year, and we are welcoming her. And we have four visiting fellows, Ryan Neft from the University of Cape Town, Cape Town Nick Huggett, our senior visiting fellow from the University of Illinois, Chris, Chris Weber from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and uh, Hannah Rubin from the Notre Dame University. And I wanted to uh, welcome all of them, and we hope to have a wonderful uh, discussion throughout the semester. Uh, a, a few news before introducing our speakers today. On uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have a workshop organized by my colleague at Pitt, Mike Dietrich, on ancestry, how we know about ancestry and uh, what it uh, means. If you're interested in that topic, you can uh, have a look at the program on the center's webpage. Go again to the calendar and look at the program and register if you want. It's a three to four hours event a day so that you're not going to be uh, over-zoomed or zoomed out. So you can come at noon on Friday, listen to three or four talks, noon on Saturday, three or four talks, and noon on Sunday for a few talks as, as, as well. Uh, we hope to see some of you at this really exciting event. Uh, today, I, uh, we are going to start the semester with the second instance of our new series called the Center Debates. And today, the Center Debates, COVID, epidemiology, and, and uh, uh, the significance of the pandemic that is upon us, both from a scientific, philosophical, and uh, social point of view. So this event was convened by my colleague at uh, Pete, uh, John uh, Fuller, who is uh, right here on the uh, screen. John is an assistant professor in uh, the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. For, he's been with us for, for uh, a year, he's published already uh, uh, widely on uh, the philosophy of uh, medicine, and that's already made a name for himself in this area. He's, uh, uh, I believe, still writing a book on the new modern medicine, and uh, we are looking, really looking forward to read that book. And he's been also extremely active during the COVID uh, pandemic crisis, uh, including in the public media, having published, for example, a uh, remarkable essay in uh, uh, the uh, Boston Review a few months ago. But he's also been active around all of these so philosophical and scientific issues raised by, by, by COVID. And uh, Mark Lipsch is our second guest uh, today, who is a professor of epidemiology in the Department of Epidemiology at Harvard uh, University. Mark has published widely on a range of topics uh, on immunolo immunology and related uh, questions. And he too has also been extremely active uh, around uh, COVID as, as one would expect. Uh, he has a paper actually just published in Nature on uh, COVID and big data. I think uh, uh, in, in either last week or two weeks ago, I mean, extremely recently, I believe. And uh, he's also been extremely active in uh, social media and also in uh, newspapers to try to provide us with scientific information and also uh, often of extremely, uh, extremely relevant from a philosophical point of view about how to model uh, COVID and, and uh, uh, um, its uh, 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 public health significance. He published, for example, uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post a few months ago, and so on and so forth. Um, so the structure is going to be uh, as follows. John will start with a 20-minute expose, then Mark will start with a 20-minute expose, then John will uh, have about 10 minutes for questions for Mark, Mark will have about 10 minutes for questions for John, then we'll take uh, uh, some questions from the audience. And have a look at the chat, and I'll tell you how to ask a question to both Mark and, uh, and, and John during the Q&A. All right, thanks for your attention, and without further ado, John, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> okay, perfect. So between Mark and I, we're going to talk about uh, a number of scientific issues, problems, even some controversies in the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we've divided up the division of labor like this. So I'm going to talk about mostly face masks and social distancing measures, including lockdown. Mark's going to talk about some issues in vaccines. And basically between the, the two of us, we're going to talk about some of the most consequential and controversial topics in public health and recent memory. So I want to start with uh, some acknowledgements. First, I want to thank Mark for taking part in this event. Um, he's been, I think Edouard probably um, undersold it when he talked about how busy and active Mark has been. Uh, if you want to feel, just to, just to make Mark blush a little bit, if you want to ever want to feel bad about your own productivity, you can take a look at Mark's productivity over the past year, both in popular pieces and in primary research. Um, so I want to thank him for taking time on his busy schedule. I want to thank the center for putting on this event as well. And then on a more somber note, I also want to, uh, given the context in which we're speaking and the topic of which we're speaking is a massive tragedy, I also want to acknowledge uh, the great loss of life and suffering over the past year. But hopefully we can come to understand the issues um, that face us by thinking a little bit about the scientific and philosophical questions that uh, underlie some of the great challenges in the pandemic. So I want to start with some headlines here that may have crossed your screen. Um, some more, I'd say, um, you know, emotion provoking headlines. So the COVID science wars, which epidemiologists do you believe and experts divide into two camps of action? Um, so I think we should take these editorial headlines with a grain of salt for sure. Um, obviously they're meant to draw you in, click on the link and take a read. Um, at the same time, I think they point to some important and interesting disagreements um, that have been just a few among the many scientific issues, problems, controversies that have faced the scientific community and um, you know, the rest of us in general throughout the pandemic. I chose, I wanted to put this, this phrase, the COVID science wars up, um, not specifically to point to the fact that some of these disagreements have been quite entrenched and maybe even ugly at times, but more to allude to the fact that there might be something going on here that's kind of analogous to what Deborah Mayo refers to as the statistics wars, a series of disagreements in the field of statistics dating back a long time that seem to have their root in fundamental disagreements around statistical theory and methodology. So what, what I'm gonna explore today in particular is whether or not some of the dis scientific disagreements in the science of COVID you know, could be rooted at least in part in some more foundational issues around evidence and decision making. So let me just. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate this mostly with the examples of face masks and social distancing measures. Um, so right up front, I'll say I'm going to be very quick in going through some of the science um, because I'm short on time. Um, and given that the audience we have today is actually quite diverse, um, this is probably going to be a little bit too um, narrow for the uh, scientists in the audience, and then the philosophical discussion is probably going to be, um, you know, not quite de detailed enough for the philosophers. But if you average it all out, hopefully people will be, on average, relatively satisfied. Okay, so I'm going to start with face masks and focusing on some of the scientific issues that have come up and some of the disagreements. And here I'm going to focus on face masks for the general public, you know, whether or not you should put on a face mask uh, if you don't have any symptoms or diagnosis of COVID when you leave your home. Um, some of the earliest reviews to answer this question came in April of 2020 when two systematic reviews were published that found insufficient evidence for face masks for this purpose. So a lack of evidence, but also in their words, a lack of evidence to justify recommendations um, or strong recommendations for the use of face masks. These were done using a typical evidence-based medicine methodology, which I'll talk about um, if there's time in a, in a while, but to give you a brief glimpse, Basically, there's a pre-specified protocol that decides what kinds of studies will be reviewed and included. And in this kind of a systematic review, although the authors didn't get a chance to do it, if you find a number of clinical trials or you know, good enough observational studies that are similar in their design, you might pull them together in a meta-analysis to come up with a, a larger, more precise summary estimate of the effect of the intervention. They weren't able to do this, but nonetheless, they found that among the individual pieces of evidence, um, they were generally of very low, weak quality in the review, in the, in the opinion of the reviewers. Okay, so 
in in April, the CDC changed its mind around masks, but at this time, the World Health Organization, the world, the WHO had not, and stuck to its line in a report in April that, in their words, there is currently no evidence masks protect the wearer in a community setting, recommending against them and reserve and for reserving them for the healthcare community. We'll come to these, these uh, themes of you know, evidence, no evidence, protect the wearer, protect others. In May, a month later, the Royal Society's Delve Initiative, a group convened to assess the evidence for face masks, recommended face masks for the, per for the public, specifically to prevent, uh, to control for uh, source control or source transmission, to prevent people who are infected from transmitting to others, uh, and, uh, and for asymptomatic and symptomatic alike when out in public. Now, the earlier draft of this report was actually given to the United Kingdom's SAGE group, which was advising the UK government in April. So they had, they had access to the same kinds of evidence as the two systematic reviewers. They just chose different evidence to focus on and came to different conclusions. In particular, the Delve Initiative looked at evidence um, that spoke to the mechanism by which masks might work. They looked more closely at the evidence for asymptomatic transmission and the role that might play in the pandemic. They, can, they uh, included you know, laboratory studies that looked at the role of face masks in blocking respiratory particles emitted for people who are infected and so on. Uh, in, the, in the words of one of the people who commented on the report, Trish Greenhall, they looked at a diversity or plurality of evidence, uh, which in, in her view was appropriate to the kind of evidence and the kind of question that the Royal Society's group was addressing. But not everyone was convinced. So a number of public health experts, you know, physicians, People in public health and scientists criticized the Delve report in the media, specifically for the evidence on which it relied. So variously, they said that it, the report was non-systematic in its methodology, was based on a paucity of randomized controlled trial evidence, and wasn't based on high quality evidence. Okay, so as I mentioned, Greenhall disagreed with this. Uh, Trish Greenhall is a uh, physician and a scientist in the United Kingdom who has been one of the more outspoken advocates for face masks. And uh, Greenhall went on in December to contribute to a narrative re review of the evidence um, that again affirmed the conclusion of the Royal Society's group. Meanwhile, in June, the WHO reversed its recommendation on face masks for the public, not because it felt that the direct uh, evidence was, was there or was of high quality, but it pointed specifically to um, increasing evidence of the role of asymptomatic spread and a growing number of observational studies that compared um, places in the world that had a higher compliance with mask usage to places that didn't at various times and found a strong association between mask use and reduced transmission. In November, the only randomized trial of masks um, against COVID-19 in this pandemic was published. That's the Danish mask study or DanMask19, a randomized trial that found no significant effect for wearer protection, whether or not people who were donning that mask when going on in public were themselves protected from infection. And so again, a kind of individual person focus rather than a focus on the role of this intervention in reducing an effect at an intervention or at a, at a population level. And finally, in December, a, the, a narrative review was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine recommending face masks, uh, in addition to one in January in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, uh, and both came to similar conclusions and reviewed, again, a diversity of evidence, um, including some of the evidence that the Royal Society's group um, had access to, as well as more, more observational evidence of different communities and countries and their experience with masks, as well as several modeling studies that um, brought in some more theoretical considerations about how masks could potentially reduce transmission in the community at a, as a whole. And what does it mean to reduce transmission in the community as a whole? Well, one way to think about this or look at this is to model the effect of masks uh, on the effective reproduction number R, which is the number, the average number of secondary infectious individuals produced by a single infectious individual uh, as a pandemic progresses. So here's just one figure from this uh, Howard et al. Uh, narrative synthesis review from this month, um, which is a heat map showing um, how we can possibly drive the R, the reproduction number below one and stop community transmission. Um, that's in the top right, the blue. You wanna be blue if you wanna drive down transmission and suppress the virus. Uh, with face masks, and this depends, according to this modeling, on the number of people who adhere on the y-axis, as well as the efficacy of masks at blocking the virus on the x-axis, and they come up with a, a particular function for modeling this based on some evidence and some theoretical concerns. This is typical of the kind of approach that we would take in part to, to addressing this scientific question.
Okay, now to introduce another problem with some related issues that brings up its own host of problems. So social distancing measures refer to um, community level interventions, or I'll, I'll use it to refer to community level interventions. They're specifically designed to reduce the number of social contacts someone has as they go out into the world. So it's not referring specifically to whether I, as an individual, you know, purposefully avoid people on the sidewalk, but to measures that a government might implement, um, such as school closures, business closures, limiting um, the number, the size of gatherings, and indeed sometimes stay at home or shelter in place orders. Sometimes these measures are referred to collectively as lockdown, but this is a non-specific and somewhat vague and politicized term that's often sometimes just used to refer to stay-at-home orders in particular. I'll try to avoid the use of the term lockdown. I don't like that term um, because of its political connotations and also because it's so um, inconsistently used. However, sometimes I will have to use it because um, some of the people in, this, in these discussions use that term. Okay, so in March, 2020, we have the first big, um, or one of the, the, the first big pieces of the puzzle that suggested that to many people that we needed to implement social distancing measures. And that was modeling from Imperial College London based on data from China and Italy experienced with the current pandemic, which predicted that many lives would be saved by viral suppression. The use of social distancing measures to drive down the reproductive number below one. Um, there were you know, lots of criticisms of the models that were used, but for our purposes, one of the more important ones was in a systematic review, a Cochrane review that was published in April which um, reviewed the evidence for social distancing measures and concluded um, when looking specifically at the, one of the Imperial College models that um, it was at a very serious risk of bias. Um, and the model that it used in order to assess that was the standard evidence-based medicine approach to assessing evidence for therapeutic decision-making, which asks how likely is it that this study or this result is gonna be biased in its estimate of the effect size. Okay. So moving on with our story. So in March or from March, there were a number of um, scientists who were skeptical around the public health consensus um, and the use of social distancing measures. I'll just single out uh, John Ioannidis, who was quite vocal in his uh, opposition to continuing lockdowns. Um, so you know, starting in an op-ed in STAT in March, Ioannidis argued that at that time, and he's continued to maintain that um, the evidence that we have hasn't been particularly reliable to support lockdowns. In particular, at that time, he argued that our estimates of the case fatality ratio for uh, COVID-19, uh, the proportion of people who die who have the disease, um, those estimates are bound to be unreliable, that there might be harms due to lockdown that we haven't measured, um, and that you know, really, if we're going to take dramatic, in his words, draconian measures, we need high-quality evidence to do that. In response, Mark um, pens a, a stat piece arguing that although the evidence we have is, is emerging and imperfect, we know enough now in order to implement widespread social distancing from what we've learned from countries like Italy, for instance. Uh, Mark wasn't alone in responding to Ioannidis. Lots of scientists have objected to his arguments, but also to some of the research he's done over the past, uh, going on a year or so. So Ioannidis went on to do primary research, looking at the case fatality ratio, a systematic review, trying to, to estimate the case fatality ratio, and a number of studies um, and the, the theme was that they were kind of like similar, summarily criticized by other scientists in the community. So one of the more you know, visible disagreements or controversies. Um, and then I'll just go through the, the rest of the story in, uh, in quick su succession because it's, I'm not gonna focus on it in the rest of the discussion, but basically a number of large studies, observational studies were done, um, one in June and one in December that looked at the European experience and then in the one in December, the experience around the world, basically comparing countries who implemented various social distancing measures and trying to associate um, those measures with the effect on reduction in the reproduction number. Um, so one was done in June in Nature and the one in December more recently was in Science. In the interim, um, several scientists in the United States and the UK penned a Great Barrington Declaration, um, a kind of policy um, response defending an alternative uh, largely to lockdowns, community-wide lockdowns in their words, and advocating something they call focus protection, which is supposed to you know, concentrate protective measures on the most vulnerable to death from COVID-19. Several scientists in response signed a Jon Snow memorandum that month, defending the public health consensus around some of the scientific issues 
but also the consensus around some of the interventions that we have at our, at our disposal and, and whether or not it's appropriate to use them and suggesting that lockdowns were one tool in the arsenal that should be used sometimes. And to, just to give you a sense of one of these important studies, the one in December in science, um, this looked at many countries around the world, again, associating the reduction in the reproduction number with various social distancing measures. And here we see a number of median estimates in terms of the reduction in R, the reproduction number associated with these various measures, and then drawn around it are 50% and 95% Bayesian prediction intervals. The idea is these authors using a large number of data and a number of countries um, were able to separate, separate out the effects of different interventions um, so we can compare them side to side. And you know, one piece of controversy here among some of the science is what's the effect of a stay at home order on top of additional social distancing measures that might already be in place. A study in June in Nature found that there was a large effect of a stay at home order. This one using more data and different analyses, though similar in nature, found that there was a small additional reduction, comparatively speaking, in the reproduction number when you've already implemented um, all these other social distancing measures. Uh, but the point is that within you know, 50% certainly Bayesian prediction intervals, they found that there was an a, 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 a association and reduction in R associated with these social distancing interventions. So, you know, in, in a kind of breakneck um, summary, breakneck speed, that's kind of the, some of the issues, some of the science and some of the controversies that we've had around face masks and lockdown. And some of them have concerns, the methodology that um, public health scientists and epidemiologists have used to justify these interventions. Like observe, often observational in nature, relying on modeling that brings in theoretical assumptions, um, a paucity of randomized controlled trial evidence. And, um, you know, in, in one sense, in the eyes of a, an, an evidence, an orthodox evidence based medicine person, maybe not high quality evidence, and maybe not good enough to justify um, community wide measures. I'll talk a bit more about this in a moment. But first, I want to canvas kind of a number of potential explanations for why scientists might disagree in general um, when it comes to you know, thorny scientific issues, but more specifically, why they might disagree in a kind of crisis climate like we have in this pandemic. You know, um, to, uh, to put it one way, a context of fast science and highly consequential science. So here's a non-exhaustive list, um, and I encourage you maybe to add to this list with your own ideas, but uh, you know, here's basically nine to 10 ideas of why scientists might disagree in, 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 over matters like these. So the first uh, explanation we should consider is artifact. That you know, in some sense, at least some of these disagreements are not real, exaggerated, amplified by media or other forces. Maybe you know, it consists of a, number, a minority number of individuals challenging the consensus. Um, and we shouldn't, uh, you know, we shouldn't overblow uh, these, these disagreements. I think for some of these disagreements, that's a fair statement to make. But I think nonetheless, there are other kinds of disagreements, let's say, where two different large reviews come to opposite conclusions. So we can't chalk up all the disagreement in the pandemic to um, you know, the sociological explanation where you have just a small number of um, you know, rabble rousers that are making it seem like there's more disagreement than there is. Although there's, there seems to be some of that as well. The number two explanation says there's really, there's really no problem here. This is just science behind the curtain. Science is messy, um, you know, people disagree, that disagreement is often rational and normal. When there's unsettled science that's very uncertain, we're gonna have people taking different positions on the science. And I think there's, some, there's something to that, um, but I think uh, there's also an additional plausibility to explanation three, which comes into conflict with number two, which is that this is not just any kind of science, this is fast science, where people are using are doing science quickly, often in disciplines that are not their own home discipline. They're putting things on preprints that are then cited by others and in the media. And all this contributes to an environment in which there's gonna be a larger number of bad studies, bad science. And when people are doing more bad science, they are more likely to come to opposite conclusions, right? Science at its best is able to kind of give us objectivity and agreement. When it's done poorly, we're more likely to foster disagreement. Number four states that maybe the, the discourse in the scientific community has become polarized the same way that the discourse in, let's say, the wider um, public has become, unfortunately, during the pandemic. So one instance of this is, you know, the debate around whether or not lockdowns are effective, um, using a nonspecific politicized term and putting it in such a way that you are forced to, to, to pick a side, you know, pro or anti, a dichotomy 
um, that ignores the fact that different measures might be appropriate in different contexts. We might want to distinguish, you know, closing K to 12 schools from putting a curfew on um, uh, going to the bar or the pub. So that kind of a that kind of a discourse often fosters disagreement or promotes it. Um, number five, I won't talk about in depth, but I'll just refer you to some good work done by some colleagues at Irvine, um, Kaylin O'Connor and Jim Weatherall, who describe belief factions as these communities of scientists, or actually they're not talking about scientists in particular, but communities of knowledge users who preferentially endorse, share, and believe information that's coming within their, their network, their in-group. Um, if we have these different belief factions, then information will preferentially spread within them, and we can have two communities that come to believe different things. So these kind of phenomena and other social network effects might sometimes um, describe even disagreement among scientists who might be, uh, to put it one way, connected to other scientists in very particular ways. Um, now these connections might fall along disciplinary lines. So six and seven describe the fact that disciplinary diversity perhaps has an important role to play in understanding the, some scientific disagreements. On the one hand, we might have epistemic trespassing which uh, Ballantyne and Dunning describe as the phenomenon where uh, someone, an expert in one discipline moves into another discipline and either does research or passes judgment on the work done in that discipline. And the risk is that they're gonna overstep their expertise. And if they're not doing it with, with caution and perhaps collaboration or humility, then they might um, basically overexert themselves. And it really begs the question of who is an expert on a particular science, scientific question in the pandemic. Um, on the one hand, this is a big issue with lots of facets. So there's a role certainly for economists in addition to infectious disease epidemiologists. But on the other hand, science is highly you know, hyper-specialized. So you know, does one epidemiologist really even have all the expertise needed to, um, to pass judgment on the science in a different subspecialty? Uh, number seven describes the fact that within a particular discipline, we might have a certain evidential framework a framework for how we look at evidence and use it to make decisions. And different disciplines might preferentially have or stick to different frameworks. So that means when different disciplines are involved in the same problem, we might have a clash of kind of philosophies or frameworks for thinking about evidence. And that was what I argued in a piece last year in Boston Review, where I suggested that you know clinical epidemiologists, especially those who are, are more within the evidence-based medicine framework for thinking about things, might be disagreeing with infectious disease epidemiologists and more traditional public health experts, perhaps in part because um, they're bringing different ways of thinking about evidence and decision making to the table that, are maybe, that may be more appropriate in their home discipline, but may be ill suited to public health. Policy proxy wars um, is something that refers to the fact that sometimes it can seem like we're disagreeing over um, you know, the strength of evidence for a hypothesis or a particular uh, the appropriateness of a, of a method for answering a question, you know, something that might seem like a more strictly scientific question, but really that disagreement is serving as a proxy conflict for the real root of the disagreement, which is a what policy we should take. Uh, in particular, it might even be around, you know, what value should influence, preferentially influence our decision making, or what decision making heuristics we should use, what our tolerance for risk should be, and so on. So issues that don't have to do with, you know, the nuts and bolts of scientific methodology or the strength of evidence. Uh, and then I won't really go into this one, but related to this idea, um, we could have a blurring of science communication and policy advocacy when the same scientists who are communicating to the public also take positions on particular policy points. Because the norms of discourse in communication and science and policy advocacy might be a bit different. Um, and it might seem like two people disagree on the science when really they just disagree on the, on the policy, what conclusions about what to do we should draw from that science. Okay, I'm not gonna have time to really go into um, this next bit. So I'm just gonna introduce a topic that uh, hopefully I'll have a bit of time to talk about later. And that's to expand a little bit on uh, number seven on the previous list. So, you know, in that Boston Review piece, I basically talked about some of the virtues of evidence-based thinking versus, you know, public health thinking in a pandemic. And I wanna, I wanna kind of reweight the scales here by by bringing us some, some cautionary notes around the role of evidence-based thinking in public health. In particular, I think that bringing a, like a standard orthodox evidence-based way of assessing evidence and making decisions to bear on population-wide public health interventions could be a bad idea. Um, in particular, because the way that we uh, amalgamate or synthesize and assess evidence in evidence-based medicine might not be appropriate um, 
into the public health context when we're considering these population interventions. So the EBM approach of systematic review of the literature and the approach of, of kind of appraising how likely it is a particular study is gonna, is gonna be biased with respect to its estimate of the effect size might be a two way, too narrow way of thinking about the role of evidence in public health. If you look at the narrative syntheses published um, by the Royal Society and other groups last year, let's say on face masks, they used a kind of approach where each piece of evidence kind of fit together in a particular way. They were non-redundant. Each on its own wasn't trying to estimate the effect size of the intervention. It was trying to answer a smaller question that needed to be answered en route to answering the larger question. So should we use face masks? That might depend in part on whether or not asymptomatic transmission is important. It should also depend on, in part on whether or not face masks can block respiratory particles and certainly should depend on whether or not respiratory particles are important to the spread of SARS-CoV-2, which we know they are. Okay, so this is a different approach that I think is, is more germane and more appropriate in this context and differs from the evidence-based medicine approach. And the last two that I won't talk about in any depth are the evidence-based medicine standards for evidence when we're talking about action and recommendation, which are often quite high. So sometimes EBM will only recommend strongly an intervention if there's high quality evidence to support it. Um, but as a reductio ad absurdum, you know, if we apply that standard at the beginning of, a, of an epidemic, we might never be justified in implementing the kinds of interventions that can prevent mass casualty. And finally, evidence-based medicine, I think quite naturally takes an individual level perspective a lot of the time. After all, it's a, it's a method for thinking about things in clinical medicine where the the object of concern is the individual in front of you, but that's not so well suited to thinking about the effective interventions on the reproduction number, on kind of population parameters, things that we should describe at a population rather than an individual level. So in short, I think scientific disagreements in the pandemic arise partly due to conflicting frameworks for evidence and decision-making um, and probably a whole host of other reasons as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Uh, uh, Max, the floor is yours on the screen. Thank you, Edouard and John, for the opportunity to be here. It's, uh, it's nice to return. I had a very good time the one time I came to the Pitt Center for Philosophy of Science about 10 years ago. Um, and it's nice to be back virtually. Uh, I should say I'm not a philosopher. I'm a philosophile, I think, if that's not, if that's a word, uh, in that I find the questions interesting. I was an undergrad philosophy major. I'm married to a philosopher, so I, um, I'm a, a groupie, I guess. Uh, so thank you for having me in that capacity. Um, uh, I will talk about three topics related to vaccines, and I'll just mention in my acknowledgments uh, that I've been fortunate to work with a phenomenal group in our center uh, and beyond um, on a number of topics, many of which will come up uh, in the next few minutes. Um, so the first topic I want to discuss is the question that has arisen really in the last few weeks about stretching the vaccine supply by accelerating the first dose and delaying the second dose for the two dose vaccines that we currently have. And I'm putting this first in part because it very closely connects to issues that John uh, just talked about and that um, I will use many of the same words, maybe not in exactly the same way, but I will try to make that connection explicit. I think it will be fairly clear. Um, and uh, I'm gonna connect the notion of evidence-based medicine or evidence-based thinking to a regulatory perspective, an FDA or European Medicines Agency type of perspective, those who try to protect us from dangerous drugs, um, and contrast that with public health thinking. So it's a little bit of a related distinction. Um, and I just, while researching this, I found the logo for Operation Warp Speed, which I thought was uh, uh, kind of funny. So I thought I'd put it here. Um, so the the strategy that has been proposed uh, starts from the fact that the two dose vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer were tested in randomized trials. I'll use the abbreviation RCT for randomized control trials a bunch of times um, for with three or four week uh, intervals between doses. And in the US, when we've been rolling these out, uh, initially the, the approach was to allocate a second dose 
to each person at the time the first was given so that we have to have a standing supply of two doses uh, in order to give the, each dose. Um, and that means that we're sort of holding back some doses relative to a more just-in-time approach. Um, and then uh, because of concerns about wanting to get more doses out to more people, uh, the UK announced a policy and then the Biden transition proposed and then Trump uh, endorsed policies to free up the second dose to speed distribution. Um, and there's now been controversy, which I have to admit, I don't understand whether there really was a second dose reserved for each of the first dose recipients. Uh, the Washington Post reported that essentially Trump was lying and then uh, it's become very unclear since then. But, but let's take this as, as if it was a real controversy because it was a real controversy. It's just whether it was a real, uh, real question about whether we could do it. So <clears throat> what does the randomized control trial evidence say? There were randomized trials of both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, this is the Moderna trial with a 28 day um, period between uh, when you get the first and the second dose. And the curves show the uh, accumulation of cases in the two groups, the placebo group and the vaccine group. And what you can see uh, in the uh, in the divergence between the two curves and in the um, and in the summary below is that well first of all is that you you have a vaccine efficacy um, overall of about ninety three percent for the Moderna vaccine and <clears throat> um, and that in the period and that's for for the full period of follow up but for the period between the first dose and the second dose. Uh, there were 35 uh, versus two cases. So very strong evidence of protection from one dose, uh, at least in the few weeks uh, between doses. So, so it would seem that giving people one dose and then waiting to give a second dose might be a very beneficial strategy if there was very strong protection uh, on the same order as the, um, as the overall protection. Uh, but there have been multiple arguments against this acceleration strategy. Uh, it's, people have said it's unclear from the randomized trial that one dose protects, uh, although I think it is clear, um, at least for the, for the period of time in the trial. Um, there's no randomized controlled trial evidence of sustained protection, which is true, because, uh, because people almost all got the second dose. There is no randomized evidence that the second dose will do its job if it's too delayed. Although I think that argument is weak because almost all vaccines other than this one use longer intervals. And this was just chosen to be speedy rather than to be the best possible dosing interval. Um, and then there are a couple of other arguments that, that, uh, that I think, one of which I think uh, I'm just not going to discuss because of lack of time. And I think the most compelling one against this acceleration strategy of trying to roll out the second doses, even if we don't have the, the or, and use them as first, is that this could lead to shortages of second doses, uh, to loss of people who don't have time to get their appointments and to loss of trust. I think these are actually compelling arguments, but they're not really scientific arguments. The, the ones I want to focus on are these issues about the first dose and whether it does any good. So I think as, a, as the FDA, as the regulator, uh, it's perfectly appropriate that they are privileging randomized evidence from a pre-specified analysis that says, we tested this regimen, it works or it doesn't work. And they are not very strongly considering secondary analyses or, or those sort of entries in the table um, that were not the primary goal of the studies because the goal of a regulator is to certify the safety and efficacy of one thing, this vaccine at this dosing schedule, under the assumption that it's much worse to give approval to something that is unsafe or useless than to fail to promote something that is actually safe and effective. Um, and I think that this kind of thinking is important, but it should be one input rather than the sum of public health decision-making. On the other hand, a different type of thinking, which is, and this distinction is very closely related to the one that John mentioned, uh, 
uh, is public health decision making, which is when we, whenever we make a decision in public health, almost we do it under uncertainty. Uh, in 2009, we had to decide whether to buy billions of dollars worth of vaccines to the for the H1N1 flu before there was any evidence that they would work. Um, in this in this uh, in this pandemic, there have been a number of those decisions that John mentioned. And for public health decision makers who are in a sense uh, aggregators of information from both regulators and others, the goal is to maximize expected public health, perhaps trying to avoid worst case scenarios, but left but being less risk averse than the regulators. The goal is to actually try to do the thing we think will work the best. Um, and so I would suggest that the right public health decision was probably to accelerate the first doses despite uh, concerns or and uncertainties. Sorry, I left off a word there. Um, so as John pointed out, throughout this pandemic, there have been a bunch of points at which a more standard string, a stringent standard for evidence uh, or for performance has been required based on this notion that we need to optimize the outcome for individuals. Um, and here's a, a list of some of those. We heard about masks and closures from, from uh, John. Another one uh, is this issue of vaccine dosing, where a, a very strict individual optimizer would say, we don't have good evidence for the first dose past a few weeks. But someone who's looking at the population benefits would say, uh, well, if there's more than half the protection from the first dose, it's better to expand the first doses. And that's consistent with prior evidence in biology. A similar thing has been happening with antigen tests, which uh, neither of us has discussed in detail. These are less sensitive than, than PCR tests. So these are the, um, the home lateral flow tests that you can do, uh, do quickly and get a quick answer as, that's especially accurate if you are shedding lots of virus. So people who are thinking from a public health perspective are, are arguing that, um, we, that speed and cost are much more important, uh, at least for home use, uh, than a bit of lost sensitivity and that in fact, Antigen tests may be better for individuals figuring out if they're infectious because, uh, because PCR detects people for too long, even after they're no longer infectious. Um, and Michael Mina, my colleague, uh, has been uh, advocating this sort of uh, distinction uh, on many of these fronts, and, and I, this benefits from conversation with him. A second issue that has, uh, that has come up is the issue of vaccine prioritization. And uh, I think one of the interesting lenses that connects us to, to, to politics and ethics a bit is that the priorities compete due to disparities in who's affected most by this virus. Remarkably strong in the United States and not only in the United States is the disparity between your risk of dying from COVID-19 if you are Black or Latino or Pacific Islander um, or indigenous, and if you're white or Asian, uh, more than twofold in all of those uh, first four categories. Uh, and that's all, all um, that's not just the risk of getting infected, but that's actually the risk of dying. At the same time, there is a huge increase in the risk of dying if you're infected uh, for people with their age. So exponential relationship between the age of an individual and the risk that they die um, if they're infected, um, exceeding 10% uh, for someone who's 90 and uh, less than a hundred, a thousandth of a percent um, for someone who is 10. So very, very striking uh, differences. And so this is something that we've been looking at scientifically uh, with a team led by Kate Bubar, a graduate student, and Dan Laramore, her supervisor um, at Colorado, um, where we've been trying to understand what the consequences are of different prioritizations. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit of the, the details, 
when we think about these, uh, there are two different uh, approaches that we can take to try to reduce cases and deaths. One is to directly try to protect those most likely to die um, or most likely to die if infected. So give the vaccine to the people who are at greatest risk of complications. A second approach is to try to vaccinate people to stop transmission and thereby indirectly protect those at highest risk. And this is a question that modelers have been looking at for years uh, on, on various, in various settings, um, but, we, uh, but, but the details are a bit different in the case of COVID-19. This is a paper that will come out uh, in science in a week or so. Um, and these are some figures from the, from the manuscript, which is currently on MedArchive, if anyone wants to look at it. Um, what we do in this paper is to compare different strategies of vaccinating under 20s, the transmission ages of 20 to 49, the high risk ages of 60 plus, et cetera. And what we see is that you see a different epidemic trajectory with different choices. Uh, the purple trajectory up here is vaccinating the elderly. So you have more cases when you vaccinate the elderly because they're not the transmitters particularly. Um, but you have more deaths over here. You reduce deaths the most by vaccinating the elderly um, in some scenarios and in other scenarios you don't. So it seems like a potentially confusing and delicate question of how you would, uh, how you would try to prioritize these, uh, these vaccines. But when we, what we find is that if you ask a different question, which I think is more from the public health policy uh, in the public health uh, way of thinking rather than in the um, individualistic way of thinking, what we find is that prioritizing the elderly is not always the best decision, but it's always, almost always close to the best. So in the United States, we are actually uh, down here somewhere. We think that the reproduction number is, uh, is modest. It's still increasing, but, but modest. And we have a, a little bit a relatively limited supply. Um, and so that would seem to favor the, uh, the vaccination of the, of the transmitters, the 20 to 49 groups. But if you increase transmission a little bit, uh, if we let up on social distancing or we get a new variant or both, then suddenly the purple strategy of vaccinating the, the elderly becomes more favorable. If you look across countries, it's some countries it's more favorable to vaccinate the transmitters, some it's more favorable to vaccinate the elderly, but it's almost never, uh, it's almost always close to optimal to vaccinate the elderly. Whereas if your vaccine doesn't work very well uh, for transmission, on the right hand side, or if your vaccine uh, or if your demographics are a little bit different, um, it can go more wrong to try to vaccinate the transmitters when stopping transmission doesn't work. So we conclude in this paper, and I'm simplifying and, and glossing a, a lot right now, but what we conclude is that prioritizing the elderly is, is a more robust strategy, even though it's not always the optimal strategy. Um, and this just repeats that. One thing I think that we, uh, the recurring theme here that recurs, uh, that, that I've noticed before uh, a long time ago is that a lot of the ethical and decision-making questions get very hard when the, decision, when the data are poor and the ethical questions become a lot clearer and less complicated uh, when, they're, when the data get better. In this case, one form of data that we really lack is, the, is data on how well the vaccine works against transmission. Um, and back in 2005, when we were trying to think about the ethics of rationing the flu vaccine, uh, I wrote this little short piece pointing out that um, most of the reasons why we were having these big debates was because we lacked evidence. So I think science can help to resolve some ethical issues, not because it gives us better values or insight into what we should value, but because it sometimes things are not, uh, sometimes the trade-offs are not as great as we think once we know, uh, once we know the data.
Do I have time for a third example? I've lost a little bit of track of time. Yes, you have, you, you, you have a bit of time, yeah. OK. OK. So the third piece that I want to mention is, uh, is the question of vaccine allocation across countries. Um, and uh, this, this was a question that uh, in May, when I was teaching my class on modeling, uh, I didn't know that anyone had ever looked at. Uh, as an exercise for my class online, we began to work on this problem together to, to try to model the question of how should we allocate vaccine if it's scarce across countries. And uh, as we um, began to work on it, uh, somebody started doing some reading in the literature and found that in fact, uh, there, was, there was a clear answer uh, that people had found. Um, and what that clear answer in the literature had found was that um, we have a strong impulse for fairness, which says that if there's a shortage of vaccine, we should allocate it equitably across countries. Um, but the literature had shown, the models in the literature had shown that actually trying to be equitable in that way can vastly reduce your efficiency or at least somewhat reduce your efficiency. Meaning you avert more cases by being uneven in how you allocate vaccines across countries compared to how you, to being even about it. Um, and this was work uh, from, the, from the early 2000s. So that had been my intuition, in fact, and that's why I thought it would be an interesting thing for the class to model. I didn't know that it had already been solved. So finding this both was disappointing to find out that uh, someone else had gotten there first, um, and also to find out that, uh, that um, uh, the intuition was confirmed and there wasn't much more to say. Um, so uh, I think a couple of the individuals who have taken on this problem uh, in our group are on the, on the seminar today, Kea Joshi, Eva Rumpler, and, and colleagues. And so the first thing they did was to take the work we had done in class and formalize it and make it better. Um, and what they found was that, in fact, uh, they could reproduce the, uh, the result that was in the literature. literature. If you have a little bit of vaccine, um, and you allocate it unevenly, uh, you do better, that is you have fewer cases between two countries um, in a model than if you allocate it evenly. And as you get more vaccine, the, the relationship gets more complicated, uh, uneven becomes, very uneven becomes a bad idea because you uh, end up giving vaccine to, to people who don't, uh, don't need it because their population has already been protected. But still, being totally even is not optimal either, and you want to be somewhat uneven. And without getting into the details, the basic idea here is that um, as you give more doses to one population, you get closer and closer to eliminating the virus. And the, the marginal benefit, the additional benefit of each dose becomes larger as you build them up in one population. So we were able to reproduce uh, this finding and, uh, and that was fine. What was interesting though, is that it turns out that as soon as you break some of the simplifying assumptions that, uh, that the simple model makes, the whole direction of the, uh, of the findings flips. So if, for example, you assume that there in a, a population, there is a, a group, say the elderly, who are more likely to die if they get infected and who should be the first to get the vaccines, <clears throat> then instead of having uh, uneven allocations be the best, as, as for example here, you find that equitable allocations, equal allocations across the two populations are ideal uh, or are close to ideal and it's not just that addition to the model that, that creates uh, a preference for even allocations. It's variation in transmissibility, which we know is true between different populations, um, variation in the risk of severe outcomes, interaction between populations and prior immunity. So all things that actually happen in real life. Um, and uh, 
And so what I think is interesting about this is that um, it's a case where adding a changing the amount of detail in the model not just gives you a little bit more precision, but actually gives a recommendation that is flipped from what the previous model gave. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think this is challenging because we don't know what the optimal level of detail is. We can't keep adding detail forever. Every model is a simplification. Um, I think one way to help with a problem like this is to focus whoops, on not just the optimal strategy, but on how bad it is if you get it wrong and sort of integrate over the possible uncertainties. Um, but I think these kinds of brittleness in models raise interesting question about the relation between the models and what they're trying to model, how we choose simplifying assumptions and the like. Um, and so I will leave you with those uh, to think about and um, we can move on to the next step. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think I'd like to uh, invite both of you to um, exchange or respond if you have thoughts about each other's uh, presentation. We can take uh, 10 minutes to, to do that. It leaves about five minutes each. And then we'll take questions from, from the audience. John, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, OK, thanks, Mark, for that super interesting talk. Um, I think in a couple of minutes, I'll just pick up on the first topic, because I think it's the one that's closest to what I was chatting about. It's also an issue that you know, I've been thinking about quite a bit, this question about whether we have any evidence, um, let alone good evidence, to suggest that delaying the second dose of the vaccine um, will be <clears throat> kind of strategy justified by the data that we have available. And one thing that's kind of irked me and a number of people have, have picked up on this is that, you know, just like in the case of face masks, you see statements like, well, there's just no evidence to support face masks, right? Obviously taking a very narrow view of what co would constitute evidence, let alone what would constitute good evidence. And I've been, I've been kind of turning over this, this neologism in my mind, clinical trial fundamentalism. And I want, I'm curious as to what you think about this. So this would be, you know, to be less charitable, an ideology to be more charitable, a philosophy of hewing very closely to exactly what the trial data seem to suggest. So interpreting the trial data their own, very narrowly. So if the Moderna trial showed that um, two doses of the mRNA vaccine that it used given exactly 28 days apart would produce 95% you know, uh, efficacy against symptomatic disease for you know, exactly, 12, you know, exactly 12 weeks, three months, uh, which is approximately how long we collected data before unblinding the trials. Um, you know, if we interpreted the, the evidence um, and that narrowly, then we wouldn't really be able to answer a number of important questions. So the first question would be, okay, so, you know, obviously we gathered this evidence at a particular place and a particular point in time, largely from 2020. Should we take that evidence to be just specific to the year 2020 or should we extend it into 2021? That might seem like a silly question, but maybe it's an actually a biologically relevant one if we consider that throughout the course of the year, certain variants might evolve and we might find based on laboratory evidence that antibodies general, generated from the Moderna vaccine don't neutralize um, the, that new strain of the virus very well. So very quickly, very what, what sound, sounds like a very trivial question could become an important one to consider. And the only way to answer it is to gather more data, to go beyond you know, the, the word of what the trial data says. You know, likewise, should we think that we have no evidence that the Moderna vaccine, once boosted at you know, 28, 28 days, will provide vaccine efficacy beyond three, four, five months? Should we be completely agnostic as to, the, as to whether or not we'll have even longer term protection from the vaccine, given that the trial participants are only gonna be followed by for a certain amount of time? And I think in both cases, the answer is of course, no, that we should interpret the trial evidence alongside what other evidence, other evidence we have. Um, and in fact, we, we always have to do this because it, in some extent, whether it's trivial or not, we have to extrapolate from the very specific context in which we gathered the data outside of the context of that trial. Right? In one way or another, this is just the problem of induction. We have to go beyond our evidence in some way. And so if, we're, if, we're, if we hew too closely to the trial data and our trial fundamentalists, then on the one hand, we're forced to say silly things like we have no idea whether or not um, you know, the 
the vaccine is going to be effective beyond four or five months. Um, and, and so that's just one, you know, one aspect of the problem is that we're always forced to, to use other information. So if we're forced into doing this, then we might as well, you know, transparently and explicitly lay out all the evidence we have that would suggest that, for instance, um, delaying the second dose would, would provide some level of uh, protection against disease and death um, while those individuals are still um, protected under that first dose. And then the question just becomes, how much certainty do we, certainty do we want to trade between um, you know, this, the high certainty we have that after two doses, given 28 days apart for the Moderna, there's going to be a high level of vaccine efficacy over a few months versus the relatively less, un, less certainty we're going to have if we go beyond the trial data and incorporate other so sources of experience and evidence in order to answer the question, you know, how long at what level of coverage or protection will one dose um, uh, give us? And the other, the other thing I'll just mention briefly is that um, and I think there's even different ways of interpreting what the trial results very specifically tell us. So in one sense, you could interpret the results very concretely and not very abstractly as saying that the, the Moderna trial shows that two doses of a very specific vaccine given a very specific number of days apart give you a very specific level of efficacy over a certain number of months. But we can just more abstractly <coughs> describe the results of that study um, to suggest that it also tells us, for instance, that two doses of an mRNA vaccine, one dose and then a booster dose, gives you some level of protection or efficacy over some unspecified amount of time. So there are a number of hypotheses that the trial results are surely relevant to. Um, and in some sense, it, you know, it, it lands us into some absurd scenarios if we just interpret the results um, based on the exact um, you know, inclusion, exclusion criteria of the trial and exactly the precise protocol that the trial list um, used. Because some of the details of the trial will of course be extraneous and irrelevant to deciding whether or not the vaccine will be effective in a different context. You know, whether, whether, whether or not um, uh, 2020 was the year of the monkey or the tiger, for instance. So we always have to think more broadly than the trial results itself. And while we're already in the business of doing that, we, better, we, we, might, we might as well seriously consider whether or not the, all the evidence we have would strongly support uh, a, one, a, delay, a delayed second dose strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I agree with your your general premise, and I think that um, that one thing it really highlights is that we are in public health. We're not doing science; we're doing decisions using science. Right? We're trying to make decisions that, by some criterion, are better than other decisions. And it would just be bonkers to say that the criteria for doing that well are the same as the criteria for doing science well. And certainly that's not an original thought. Lots of people um, have, have pointed that out, but I think somehow it gets lost. And in particular, medicine has built up for some good reasons, this whole structure of randomized trials and all of that, um, that, that as being the standard of evidence when in fact, um, uh, and, and even the picture that we do basic science in the lab and then we invent drugs and then we test them in trials and it's a sort of one way street. But the other role of basic science, the other role of like knowing what's true about other vaccines or about other natural infections without vaccines is to teach us how to extrapolate, like what kinds of extrapolations from the trial are rational and what aren't. The fact that we know that this is mRNA and so that these two are both mRNA vaccines um, means that we can make certain comparisons between them that we have a principled reason not to say is the same for say a viral vectored vaccine. And those are, I think the role of basic science in external validity of trials and how much you can extrapolate them um, is an interesting um, direction because it's, in medical science, we sort of have this very naive or, or limited view of what basic science does for us. It, it tells us what drugs to invent and then test, and then we throw it away. <laughs> we sort of throw it away and pretend we didn't know any of that uh, when we make regulatory decisions. So it's like the fact that something kills a virus in cell, in cell culture is not really relevant to regulatory decisions. 
Um, the other thing I guess I would say um, is uh, we were we have these exceptions even to clinical trial fundamentalism that are really big ones like off-label use of medicines. Any doctor can prescribe roughly speaking any drug for any reason they want uh, subject only to malpractice laws. Um, that's not clinical trial. <laughs> I mean, that's the opposite of clinical trial fundamentalism. And sometimes that's actually a really great thing because that's the best thing they can do is to use something off label. But um, so I, I think the, the, the coherence of the view that, that we have to only somehow narrowly hew to clinical trial results is odd. I would also say, and this is just a sort of observation, I'm not sure it's rigor, it's certainly not rigorous, it may not even be true. My sense is that in rich, highly uh, developed countries, this kind of thinking is more prevalent than in global health more broadly. So in global health, people try to maximize vaccine impact. They don't try to maximize fidelity to clinical trials and they change dosing intervals and they do things that seem based on the evidence likely to be helpful. Um, and I think there's a certain, it sort of goes along with our sense of entitlement to having the perfect medicine for, the, for each patient, which of course is not true in the United States, but, but we have this vision that, that our goal or that our, that our aspiration should be that each patient should get perfect care, um, which just nobody else in the, much of the rest of the world doesn't, doesn't stick to. They acknowledge trade-offs and costs, even, even the UK, for example, acknowledge trade-offs and costs, et cetera. So I think, I think there are a lot of interesting reasons to not stick to clinical trials narrowly, apart from the incoherence of it that you point out. All right, thanks. Mark, do you want to add something or shall we open the floor to, to the audience? Yeah, I, th I mean, this, I think that covered a lot of the same questions that I was going to ask and that I'd much, uh, I'd love to know what other people are thinking about. So let's pass it on. All right. Thank, thank you very much to, uh, to, uh, to both of you for these uh, really exciting talks. Sandy, do you want to go first? Sandy? Oh, I think there was Maybe some... muted. Yeah, somehow. OK. Uh, no, no, on, on near oh. Ayan. I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. I apologize. Oh. Please go, go first. And uh, uh, then okay. I'll I didn't quite understand that if I put a question in the q and it will be featured. So uh, I'm sorry. So <laughs> um, I guess I had a question for uh, Dr. Lipsich. Uh, uh, am I right that the models that you presented that uh, suggest that pretty much no matter what country we're checking it in and uh, uh, what particular circumstances, um, the outcomes are, as I think you put it, something like pretty much as good uh, or as bad uh, if we allocate the vaccine with priority to the elderly versus to people who transmit it more. Uh, that assess, and, and it, you know, there, there, there are differences, but they're small, I thought you said, um, and that's not quite of, what I said. Okay, can, so can I just clarify what I was trying to say? Because I said sure, it very yeah. fast and probably not very clearly. Um, what I was trying to say was it's a bit asymmetric that under various forms of uns uh, under our base case and various forms of uncertainty, allocating to the elderly is almost never a really s badly suboptimal. It's not always optimal, but it's almost never. Yep. A disaster. To give one example of a kind of uncertainty that undermines the opposite strategy, if the vaccines are quite ineffective in blocking transmission, then trying to prevent transmission with them is obviously not a very good idea. So it's a bit, it's the asymmetry that makes it easier to resolve which way to go. I think maybe the, the okay. Um, my question is, um, am I right that this assessment is based on the big assumption that having, say, two years of life expectancy um, lost is as bad as uh, having 55 years of life expectancy lost. 
Um, it, there, so we actually, in the supplement, we look at years of life lost. And it, as you would imagine, it's somewhere between infections and, uh, and deaths in terms of its, what it recommends. Um, to a large degree, it doesn't make much difference because uh, the sharpness of the increase in death rates with age is so striking, it's, it's exponential and very steep, that even if you count a 90-year-old dying less than you count a 70 or a 50-year-old dying, um, the chances of a 90-year-old dying are way, way, way higher. Um, and so it just numerically for this infection doesn't, doesn't make as big a difference as most of us expected up front. It makes a difference, but not much, not as much. I think, uh, see if we are a bit pressed for time, uh, I'll, I'll intervene and, and I'll stop this exchange here. Sandy, do you want to, uh, do you want to? Yes, thank you. Thank you both of you for a really interesting presentation. There's so much to talk about. I want to focus on one issue. Um, that I myself have addressed in other contexts of complexity and policies tuned to the complexity. And that has to do with, uh, I, which defends a kind of robustness assessment rather than optimality. So maybe this is for Mark. But one of the, and I, I appealed to some work done by um, Lempert about biodiversity loss and other ecological kinds of complexity with un, ineliminable uncertainty. So you're never gonna add, you know, do enough research to get you know, uh, a lot known to be able to come up with some kind of policy that addresses all of the, the component issues. But one thing they introduce um, is that um, once, you've, once you've looked at what's the most robust policy for the conditions uh, that you considered, uh, why not then an iterated account to try to do more modified policies? So these are more complex policies. So single dose for those under 60, double dose for those over 60. That's one simple example. But this iterated ca case uh, challenges the kind of framework that the predict and act framework was something that's more about um, adaptively adjusting the policies, both the conditions and over and what we learn over time. So I'm wondering whether the approach you use to robustness takes into account this more iterated, dynamic, adaptive kind of way in which robustness analysis might be implemented. Yeah, thanks. I don't think it does. In, it certainly doesn't in a formal way. I think um, one of the interesting things in well, so one of the challenges of doing that in modeling and informally comparing policies is that as soon as you allow adaptation, the space of policies gets wildly larger, um, uh, and your and the quality of the adaptation depends on the quality of the information, which is itself another variable that you don't necessarily know. But um, but just uh, reflecting on the particular case now. I mean, there's been a, I've heard now from multiple different angles, people saying, look, we just messed up. We, we tried to do the optimal thing by putting people in order and it's just too complicated. We can't get enough vaccine out and we should just give it to everybody who wants it and let them fight over it. <laughs> um, not, not really, but, um, but, but we should just open it up to everyone because, um, all this being clever is actually doing more harm than good, even to the people it's trying to help. Um, and I don't know if that's been analyzed formally. I think that's a strong intuition that a lot of people have, and I'm coming to share it, although I, I really don't understand actually all of the reasons why the vaccine rollout has gone as badly in the US as it has, or as slowly. But, but I think there is a, a growing sense that the adaptation is to just throw up our, the, the right adaptation might be to throw up our hands and say, a lot of people did a lot of work and let's just throw it away and and open it up to whoever can get to the vaccine first. Um, there are a lot of equity reasons why that might not be ideal, but, um, but uh, you know, there might be modifications of it. So I think in real life, of course, people don't stick to their plans <laughs> and countries don't stick to their plans. And we're beginning to see that already. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.
Jai Ferguson, please. Right. Hello. Um, hi, thanks both uh, for, for your talks. Um, I think one of the issues with the rollout or something that's created a lot of problems had to do with uh, high rates of refusal by um, individuals who were in um, sort of phase, phase 1A. And I'm wondering, uh, Mark, whether the, the, your, your models um, uh, take that into account if that's part of the un uncertainties uh, that not every vaccine offer means vaccine uptake. And if we um, made room for hesitancy and refusal in the models, whether that would uh, change um, what we learn or how, how what, what approach we should take. Yeah, I think we do actually have a, a very simple approach to hesitancy, which is that we open it up to, in the model, we open it up to the rest of the population when 70% of the group has been vaccinated under a certain rollout procedure. Um, so that's a, you know, a very simple um, and not very um, realistic way, but, but a way that we account for not everybody taking it. Um, you know, I think the hard thing about modeling behavioral feedbacks is that those are poorly understood. And um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the hesitancy is going to be how long it lasts and how strong it is depend, will depend on people's perceptions of whether it was safe for their cousin or whether it was safe for their healthcare provider or whether whatever. Um, so I think um, it's tricky, but, <laughs> but it's, it's an important question to include. It's just hard to know how to, how to do it. I, I can think of a hundred ways to do it and I don't have a hundred, hundred X the time to do it, uh, nor to do any of my coworkers. Thank you very much. Halle, first, please, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing your name right. I apologize. <laughs> Well, that was pretty good, thank you. I, I want to thank our two presenters. I thought this was absolutely excellent. You, you made points that uh, come up in daily uh, conversation in many places. And uh, I recently taught a principles of epidemiology course and it came up among the elderly who were in the class, let alone the younger folks. Uh, the one thing that, um, that we haven't discussed but just started to touch on in the last question was the trust in the communicator. And we've seen, at least I've seen a lot of people who have, um, who have believed certain types of science, if you will, uh, because of the headline or because of the information in the, in the local papers or because of who they are. And they're good communicators, even if their policies are poor. And one of the things we haven't seen is how we saw the ACIP and we saw the CDC uh, talk about different priorities as well as bioethicists, for example, but, but we never heard much from the US Preventive Services Task Force or the Community uh, Preventive Services Task Force. The latter does population policy based upon what's feasible in public health circumstances. And I'm wondering if you could comment upon that and why you think some of that communication didn't come from those organizations. Because the point you made was clear that there is a difference between what we're doing clinically to individuals and what, uh, what works in populations. And, uh, and yet that distinction was rarely made in communication. Yeah. I mean, I think to this, I don't know those task forces as well. Um, I mean, it's clear that in the United States, unlike every place else in the world, to a degree greater than almost every place else in the world, the people who should have been out front on this pandemic were not, and some um, very unfortunate people were in their place. Um, and uh, so that's a general thing that's specific to the US and a few other places, but not many. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I have anything sensible to say about your specific question. I, um, uh, I think it's maybe a, a, just a case of not the right people being, <laughs> being involved. But ACIP, 
does have to some extent that same role of trying to say what's doable um, and what's best from a public health perspective. Maybe I'll just uh, chime in here. So this isn't really, maybe this isn't really a direct response to what you're saying, but um, it does come to mind based on your question. So I think when this is all said and done, we're gonna to have to think very carefully around the ethics and norms of science communication and science policy advocacy, because um, in many different respects, I think it hasn't been done well. And it's raised a lot of questions to my mind around the kinds of norms we expect from scientists when they're doing science communication versus you know, science policy advocacy. These two things I think might plausibly have different constraints, different norms that might run into conflict. So science communication, transparency, forthrightness, admitting uncertainty and so on. Um, in some contexts at least, you know, advocating a position has very different norms. You try to convince your interlocutor, the person who's listening to you of your position. But if you're a scientist, you probably, I think plausibly bring in other kinds of obligations to, to just like in the context of science communication, admit of uncertainty and be as tra transparent and forthright as possible. So there are kind of a, there's kind of a role conflict, at least um, potentially here, when um, scientists are playing such a heavy role in uh, both doing and communicating science, but also advocating policy. And fortunately, I think a lot of scientists, scientists had to take that role on because there was a, a leadership vacuum. Um, so a lot of our, uh, a lot of the leaders that stepped up and helped to guide the way were in fact scientists. Not, and, I, and that's not to say that, of course, scientists shouldn't play an important role in policy or policy advocacy. But I think that we need to, to take a step back and look again at this question around what we what we expect of scientists in these various these various roles. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and and just add that the um, uh, yeah, I certainly you know I don't think that. Sanjay Gupta wants to hear my opinion because I have brilliant ideas about the best policy. He wants to hear my opinion when he does occasionally because I know something about science. And so I think as a scientist talking about policy, as I did with the, with the second dose thing, you know, I think there are serious objections to it that need to be discussed and that maybe that, that are, that are, you know, that I come down in favor of, of getting the, those doses out, but the only sensible way to say that is here are the pluses and here are the minuses, not to say, oh, let's pretend there are no minuses. That's just not what scientists are supposed to be doing. And if we do it too often, uh, which some people are, and some of their names have been mentioned in the previous discussions, if you do it too often, then nobody wants to hear your opinion because it becomes clear that you're not talking about science, you're talking about your private beliefs. And I think it's hard, but important to try to separate those two. It does seem like there's less, uh, or I haven't heard much policy, uh, sorry, philosophy work on the philosophy of risk communication. There's a lot of social psychology work at, at Carnegie Mellon, as we see in the background of uh, uh, Alex London there. There's been a lot of work in the, in the behavioral economics of all this, but not in the philosophy of all of it. I wonder uh, if there's not somebody out there who might have an interest in doing that kind of work. Thank you, thank you both, uh, and from the center as well. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Alex. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Really interesting presentations. Appreciate it. I just wanted to um, <clears throat> ask you to sort of take what you've talked about and maybe turn it around. Um, so ideally, we want uh, data that's going to address the questions that we want to answer. So. Um, if we turn the discussion around, what morals can we draw from what you talked about for the way that we should design studies that we could carry out going forward uh, that would address some of the controversial topics that you talked about? So for instance, do you think that we still need, uh, is there sufficient uncertainty around masks uh, as a public health intervention that we should run a trial around masks? And if so, um, what morals can we draw from what you've said about how we should design such a trial? Should it be a fastidious trial that tells us whether under ideal conditions, masks um, provide the appropriate kind of source control or, or um, you know, infection control, <clears throat> or should it be a more pragmatic trial at a population level? And if it's that more pragmatic population level trial, then under what kind of like education for the instructions for using the mask um, I'm just wondering whether you think there's a feasible trial design uh, 
that would generate evidence that would that would help us move forward uh, on these kinds of uh, questions. Because there's a lot of discussion about what do we do with the evidence we have. And part of the underlying question here is, is there a responsibility on the part of the people who run studies, not to just run a study about masks, but to run the, a particular study that, that asks, that answers the right kinds of questions. And it can be irresponsible to run a study about masks if it's, if it's not focused on answering the right sort of questions. I can, I could start if you'd like, Mark. Um, yeah, so thanks for keeping us honest and getting us to say something more specific and sticking to our guns, Alex. Um, I think we'll, we'll start off just by pointing out a point of fact that um, in this relevant to your question, there is actually, according to clinicaltrials.gov, a cluster randomized controlled trial um, of uh, face masks in uh, that's supposed to be taking place in Guinea-Bissau in West Africa and should be wrapping up at some point. Um, I don't know a lot about the methodology from the trial registration there, but um, it's a cluster trial, which I haven't talked about, but it's potentially a, an alternative to this, um, to the kind of approach to evidence for public health that I was talking about, where it is possible in some circumstances maybe not in all circumstances, but in some, um, for those who don't know, to randomize not just individuals, but groups or uh, communities to different conditions and then um, treat those groups as the unit of analysis and then run an analysis to determine using all the bells and whistles of a randomized trial, um, whether or not that community level intervention was effective. Uh, so yeah, there is one of these that's supposed to be going, that's supposed to be happening at some point soon. So that I think in the first place, um, you know, that shows that at least in principle, um, it's possible, at least in some circumstances, to run and to gather just the, just the kind of high quality unbiased evidence that EBM people want, even for an intervention like face masks potentially. Now, whether such an intervention could be started today, given now what we know, uh, versus you know, eight months ago when this trial was started, since we have more evidence and perhaps some would argue we might not be in a position of equipoise is a tricky issue, but and the point is that I don't want to completely foreclose the possibility that um, that for a question like face mask use, a randomized pragmatic trial might be just the kind of thing we might need to settle a question. And the, one of the one of the reasons that I kind of like this this the potential of this um, this trial that I saw registered is that it's taking place in a context in which which we might might be very different than let's say Denmark or other places. And so you know you ask for what kinds of studies do we need in order to inform us, I think to some extent, when it comes to interventions that are very context specific and might interact with cultural factors, we need at least sometimes some local evidence to help guide us. So you know, the pragmatic trial in Guinea-Bissau might be just the kind of thing we need for that kind of context to answer whether you know, a, a homegrown local um, initiative in order to increase the uptake of masks would be effective in that context. Um, so there's maybe maybe there's some remarks to kind of rebalance the scales again to suggest that sometimes you know randomized pragmatic trial might be what we need in a public health context as well. It's just that sometimes we might not be able to run that kind of study. So in those cases, we have to, to make do with what we can what we can gather. Yeah, I guess I would add I put in the chat a, a nice link a link to a nice piece by uh, an economist and philosopher and a um, Economist and a uh, epidemiologist, disease ecologist from Princeton um, in science about such trials that came out uh, early on in the pandemic. Um, uh, I mean, I think one thing about masks that's different is, um, you know, they're not unsafe, right? It's pretty clear that they're not going to harm people, and they're not that unpleasant. I mean, I really don't like wearing masks. I'll be very honest, but but the cost of getting it wrong is really, really different from a drug or a vaccine or, or, or other things. So I think the, the standards for evidence also need to reflect that decision context. Um, and I'm not sure that randomized trials are the way I would go for that reason. But, <clears throat> but putting that aside, um, I think, uh, and thinking about vaccines, for example, um, I think, I'm not sure if this is quite the, the question you were asking, Alex, but to me, one of the things that we really need to know, because it addresses one of the big uncertainties, is how do vaccines affect transmission? And um, it affects everything from, you know, individual decisions about whether grandma can visit, 
to um, to societal decisions about who should get prioritization and, and many things in between. Um, and so I think uh, trying to enhance the public health um, outcomes in trials in general, uh, where the where the interventions are individual level ones like vaccines or drugs, in the antibiotic resistance world, uh, again we have um, uh, there are a lot of indirect effects that are of interest um, for drug for use of antibiotics. Um, so I think trying to remember to 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 include as many of those kinds of public health outcomes. Um, in trials as possible, given the time and budget constraints, um, is a good rule of thumb and one that's been relatively neglected. Thanks, Mark and John. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, stop here for today because we've reached the end of our uh, meeting. I uh, sorry for the people who are waiting for uh, their question. Um, Alex and uh, oh, sorry, uh, Mark and and John, um, thanks again for uh, taking part to uh, this exchange. I think we uh, we've learned a lot, and thanks to the audience also for 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 the question. And we hope to see some of you at the conference on ancestry. It's how to infer it and its social meaning on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, as well as to the uh, first lunchtime talk next Tuesday at noon, given by John Norton. Um, and uh, um, thanks again, Mark and, uh, and John. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.